Good day and welcome to today's panel, How Do We Address the Community in Solutions for Online Public Health? My name is Julie Levison. I'm an infectious diseases physician and health disparities researcher at Mass General Hospital and assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, both in Boston, where I co-direct the community research program at our large community health center. My work focuses on healthcare delivery and innovation in underserved populations with a focus on community engagement. We have a real all-star panel today, and I'm so delighted to introduce them in alphabetical order. Sarah Hess is a public health expert at the World Health, health Organization. Since 2014, she served as a technical officer in the HIV and hepatitis department, and since 2018, with the Health Emergencies Program on High Impact Events Preparedness. Sarah works in the infodemic management pillar of the COVID-19 response, leading work on partnerships and community empowerment. Carol Laney is a senior program officer with the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine based in Washington, DC, where she directs the National Academies Based on Science project that counters online misinformation related to science and health. She also manages committees of subject matter experts to write consensus reports that respond to science policy questions. Also delighted to have Ifioma Azoma, who is the founder and principal of Earthseed, a consulting firm supporting individuals, organizations, and companies on issues relating to public policy, health information, and related communications. Her past public policy work has been widely cited, uh, including by the WHO, the Washington Post Editorial Board, and New York Times, and I should say, and her current work widely cited as well. And she has worked as well at Pinterest, Facebook, and Google in the past. Leila Zia is a PhD material scientist and engineer. She is the director and head of research at the Wikimedia Foundation that operates the Wikipedia and its sister projects. She manages a team of research scientists working on three areas of research, addressing knowledge gaps, improving knowledge integrity, and building the foundations for a stronger research community around the Wikipedia projects. So to begin, we recognize that social media has an unusual capacity to broadly disseminate information, putting health information and its consequences at a knife edge. Online platforms have the capacity to both empower individuals to preempt disease and promote well being, but also leave individuals vulnerable to claims widely disputed by content experts, such as pu public health leaders and scientists. Furthermore, online platforms provide a collective capacity for individuals to find one another and coalesce across shared beliefs, but also there is the opportunity for social divisiveness. So to explore these questions, our panel today will cover these themes, the following four themes and more as all of you provide us your questions, which we will engage with. First, we'll address models for online health information production. Second, we'll talk about engaging historically marginalized populations. Third, we'll talk about resilience to misinformation. And last, and importantly, we'll talk about trust and in information. So to start us off, I'm gonna ask a question to our panel and I'd, I'd love to hear each of your thoughts. So if we could begin by discussing models for health information content production, really with attention for processes of modifying and disseminating data and integrating end users in that process. Can you speak to how this production works in, pro in practice and how do we include more voices with particular attention to vulnerable populations? If Yoma, would you like to start us off? Forgot to unmute, absolutely. Uh, so I have a little bit of experience with this and I'm, I'm really excited to hear Layla talk about some of the work that she has done as well. Um, when I was at Pinterest, part of what I led was working with organizations like the WHO, CDC, and others to provide content for the platform in the native form that users see the um, content. And the reason why that's important is because 
when platforms address misinformation, and there's more of that now, though there could be a lot more done, what you're left with is a void. There's no information that people can go and find that's good. And so what we need is public health organizations to create good content, but understand that it needs to be in the format that people are used to seeing it on the platforms. And so my hope is that we have more of a one-to-one -one relationship with the platforms working with public health organizations to create content and make sure that it's tailored to the way that people engage with the content on the platforms. Layla, would you like to respond? Sure. Um, model for content production and knowledge production on, on the internet. Um, I'll, I'll start by starting from an example that is maybe more present to all of us, which is the COVID-19 and the coverage of COVID-19. Particularly what I want to highlight is that when we think about Wikipedia as an online encyclopedia, we are talking about a project which is volunteer run and um, supported by a nonprofit organization. And it's incredible to look at the numbers and what the Wikimedia and Wikipedia community of editors have done over the past months. In more than 175 languages, we have coverage of COVID-19 articles. There has been more than 850,000 edits since the beginning of the pandemic. More than 80,000 volunteer editors have come together to make this content available for people across the world. These are incredible numbers where many of us are used to large numbers. But if you think about people coming from all across the globe for free, doing work for putting free knowledge out there, these are amazing numbers. I'll talk briefly about like how the Wikipedia knowledge production works. So you have basically two components, um, a decentralized part and a centralized part. The decentralized, decentralized parts uh, allow every Wikipedia language to have its own norms for writing a Wikipedia language, to come up with its own um, norms, subset of policies, things that relate to the readers of that language and prioritization mechanisms which are related to that language. On the other hand, you have the centralized piece, which is shared across all Wikipedia languages. You need the content to be verifiable. The verifiability means that the content needs to have reliable sources. The language needs to be written in a neutral way because this is an encyclopedia. No forking of the article is allowed, which means on a topic such as COVID-19, we're going to have one article in a given language. And if you and I don't agree on what should go in that article, we need to go and build consensus and talk with each other and agree. And of course, the project is also highly transparent, which means every edit is viewable by readers and other editors. We know exactly who has edited at what time on what page. And that level of transparency allows for course correction on Wikipedia. I would say the Wikipedia model is maybe different than some of the other models we see in terms of uh, knowledge production. Um, happy to continue the conversation, but that's for now how much I can share. Wonderful. Sarah, would you like to carry forward thinking about the public health perspective? Sure, thanks so much. And uh, really happy to be here having this discussion. I think I'd like to uh, pick up on uh, two points, actually, that Ifeoma made and, and Leila too. One about the, the format of the content and the information needing to be in a style and in a structure and that is easily digestible and relevant to the needs of the person who is seeking that information. Um, obviously, coming from the World Health Organization, it's uh, for us the underlying premise of every, um, particularly in the context of health emergencies, is that the, the information would need to be scientific and evidence-based. But then once you have often what is very technical information, how do you then translate it into something that's usable, digestible by different communities? And I think this is where the community really comes into it because the opportunities then are there for there to be this co-creation, this adaptation of information into a format that is digestible, shareable, and I think that's particularly relevant to this conversation today because what we want is we want people to be sharing information that's um, evidence-based and trustworthy. So we want the content and information to be shareable 
um, and relevant to contexts. And I think um, particularly at WHO, that's really where we try to look at the end user of the information um, and where we we don't have the capacity in-house to adapt information to every different community, but that's where partnerships, I think, come into it and the community comes into it. So, um, yeah, happy to uh, pass over to Kara now. I'm sure uh, she can add to that too. Well, thanks. Um, yes, I'd like to um, pick up on what Layla said about knowledge production and different formats. So the National Academies is um, an organization that was established over 150 years ago to provide independent advice um, that advances science, technology, and medicine for the um, betterment of society. And traditionally, we've done that in the form of reports that are written by a number of experts from different fields that are brought together to answer a specific question. And this is a um, very thorough process and a very um, well-informed process about whatever the state of the science is about the question in, 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 at the center of the report, uh, but it's not a quick process. And as we know, in this um, time of the pandemic, um, we need just not accurate information, but we need that information to be out quickly. And so we've taken uh, the opportunity of the pandemic um, along with some um, changes that we are making earlier to try to get information um, into that void space that Ifoma was talking about um, in different ways. So one way is that we uh, have a standing committee on infectious diseases and emerging threats in the 21st century that was established at the end of February, early March to quickly write um, consensus statements about what we knew about the state of the science about the coronavirus at that time. So this committee tackled um, topics such as aerosol spread back in um, back in March and April, as well as what we knew about the vulnerability to young adults um, to the virus. And um, um, also uh, uh, the seasonality, whether it was going to be affected by the seasons. And so they were taking on those topics um, early on, writing short reports and getting those out to the public um, as quickly as possible. And then the Based on Science program that Julie mentioned that I um, operate was trying to translate those reports into one page easily shareable content that could be um, that could answer people's questions in the platforms where they might encounter uh, misinformation. Um, and then the other um, point I wanted to tie into Layla is that we've also um, tried to make more op um, more take more advantage of the Wikipedia community and our experts. So we held our first Wikipedia edit-a-thon focusing on climate change science earlier this year. And more recently, we brought um, community, our community of experts in vaccines and communication specialties to a vaccine safety edit-a-thon that was held earlier this year. So we're trying to find new ways of getting our robust science content into uh, vehicles that more people encounter instead of our traditional audiences of policymakers. Let's transition, I think, with one of our charges, which is thinking about how we engage historically marginalized populations. And Sarah, you spoke also about the concept of co-creation and adaptation. So interested in our panelists' perspectives about how we engage in effective public health communications with communities that in the past have been left behind by public health efforts. Terry, would you like to start? Yeah, I can, I can make a start on that. Um, I think, I mean, a, apart from the ob kind of obvious needs around communicating with historically marginalized populations, um, such as language, um, transla translations, and understanding um, literacy levels, I would say that engaging um, marginalized populations in communication really requires a sensitivity to the socioeconomic um, context as well, because often um, it's all too easily overlooked in communication um, and the way that people, I mean, people communicate. I think, I mean, one simple example that's come out very clearly throughout COVID was um, some of the public health measure, measures that were being um, mandated, obviously, such as washing hands and, and mandatory mask wearing, have implications in different settings and, and, and in some settings cannot be implemented at all. So for, for, for us, it would be really important to meet those communities where they are in their situation, understand the context that they're in. 
what is this public health measure or piece of science or information or whatever, what does it mean in your context? How can you implement it? And if you can't, what are the solutions that we can find together? And based on that dialogue and that um, that listening that can can happen between the community and the, the scientists, the community and the policymaker, you can co-create this guidance. So this would be the gold standard guidance with your, your public health measures based on context, based on populations. We've had a dialogue, we've had a conversation, and these are the adaptations in order to make these measures feasible and implementable. And I think those are kind of really important ways of, I mean, they're really concrete ways you can can do something about it. And um, we can discuss a lot more about how to actually do that in terms of engaging community leaders and um, working with NGOs that are already working with marginalized groups. And there are a lot of ways to reach these populations, but I think it really is about meeting them where they are and understanding um, their information needs better. <laughs> Leila, I wonder if you have any reactions given Wikimedia's interesting platform of trans potential for transparency and how uh, content is arbitrated when there are disagreements. How does that lend itself for perhaps some opportunity for more egalitarian vetting of content? Yeah, so I, I can comment on this, although I should say my knowledge around marginalized communities will be very limited. So I'm, I'm going to kind of hesitate from going very far there. Um, what I can hypothesize is that generally Wikipedia works based on the premise that we're not talking about the content only, but empowering people to participate in the knowledge production and knowledge curation, right? And that is closely related to what some of the marginalized communities have experienced around structures of powers and being kept out and not having a voice, right? So generally I hypothesize that if you empower people to participate, if you make the edit button available and help them engage, they are going to share their knowledge and also consume the knowledge in a different way. This is only my hypothesis. I'm happy to be tested, tested and uh, validated or not. Um, I will say in the context of Wikipedia, every edit that comes to Wikipedia, almost for, for almost all the Wikipedia languages, once you click publish, the edit is immediately available for the readers to view. However, this publishing the edit is not the end of the story. That edit is being broadcasted to the series of bots, machines, humans who monitor the pages. And actually every edit is added to a stack of to be patrolled edits um, that a human or a machine or a combination of two will go and check basically whether this edit is, is a good edit or not, right? Wikipedia works based on the assumption that the majority of the people will do the right thing. So by lowering the barrier for contribution, allowing everyone to edit. Basically, you increase the chances of incorrect or vandalized edit to be corrected relatively quickly because now every reader can fix the issue that they see. And because of the transparency, if there are systemic issues that are happening, you can then mitigate that. So for example, if there, there's a user that is systematically sprinkling um, bad information across the articles, you can ban the users or like uh, find other ways to more quickly control. But generally, what we see is that for the most part, people are doing the right thing, right? So by helping people to engage, they are engaging in positive ways, and they are um, they're making free knowledge more available to more people. If you, I'm, I'm curious to your reactions to Layla's point about making the edit button, so to speak, freely available, and how that might um, operate with historically marginalized populations. I think it's uh, what Layla said ties in uh, very closely with what Sarah said. It's all about listening. Um, I wanna say first, in these conversations, we often talk about marginalized communities, but don't include them in the conversation. And that's the, one of many missteps that public health communicators and the public health community are making. We can't make assumptions about the reasons why people trust or distrust public health without asking them. And often uh, I hear digital literacy come up as uh, 
a solution or one of many solutions that we can address and specifically for marginalized communities. And there's nothing wrong with digital literacy efforts, but I think what it, when people go to that, what they're doing is making an assumption about marginalized communities being digital, digitally illiterate. And that's not the case that I've seen. Um, science is about asking questions, but when those questions come from certain communities, then there's pushback. We should be accepting of the questions that people are asking, and we should engage in more peer-to-peer -peer conversations instead of what I see often, which is sort of an authoritarian, top-down, these are the facts, if you don't get on board with them, there's something wrong with you, when often we're not interrogating, as Sarah said, the socioeconomic situations that folks are in. Um, we're not engaging in talking about structural inequality and the reason why certain folks may not be able to engage. When we're talking about um, marginalized communities here in the United States, I wish that every community had access to Wikipedia. Many do not because folks don't have stable internet connections. And so there are many things that are standing in the way of folks getting good information. And often the assumption is that they're not seeking out that information and that's not the case. So um, my, my biggest suggestion would be to include the communities when we're, especially when we're talking about them and to do more of the listening that Sarah mentioned. Kara, any reactions? I think a few of points are so important about the engagement and the peer-to-peer -peer listening. Yes, I think so too. And so I think we, in order to do that listening, we need to have um, the support for public health to have the opportunity to do that listening. Um, the National Academies, as well as many others, has um, produced many reports on the likelihood that a pandemic would happen and so the need for investment in public health and I think we see in the U.S. that some of the ways we are experiencing the pandemic has to do with our chronic underinvestment in public health. So the U.S. needs um, to and others I'm sure but the U.S. for sure needs to to re-up its investment in public health and one of the things that needs to happen with that investment in public health is the prioritization of listening to um, underserved communities. And when those underserved communities are engaged with through community-based organizations that are um, more in touch with the people um, whom they are serving, I think we'll see better results, um, both in terms of like what public health can produce and, and what those communities experience in terms of um, their health in general, and also our ability to respond to misinformation in those communities. And to can I say, please or add one more thing. We have a model for this already. The Ebola work that's been done and widely praised in the DRC and in other countries in Central and Western Africa uh, has been this model of engaging with communities when, and the WHO has played a huge part in that, um, and I applaud their efforts. When you go to a community that has not, underserved means something, marginalized means something. And those terms exist because of structures that have been created to keep certain folks out. When we're then going to those same communities and saying, you have to take a vaccine, we're not going to explain all of the reasons why, we're not going to explain all of the things that went into it, but you need to take it because you need to trust us. There's going to be pushback and that pushback is fair and we should be accepting of that. Uh, the work that happened in the DRC, I just thought, was so incredibly moving and important and important that more people are aware of it because part of their approach was asking people, what are the things that ail you, period? This is not just a conversation about Ebola. This is a conversation about your access to food, about your access to medicine in general. If you're concerned about primary care issues that you have and you don't have access to primary care, then Ebola is not gonna to be top of mind for you if you have an ailment that is right there and an issue for you every day, or your child does or your spouse does. And so we have to understand that things don't happen in a vacuum. Yes, we are all concerned about COVID, but people are also concerned about cancer diagnoses access to healthcare for. They're concerned about their kids not having enough food to eat. And so if that's a concern for you first, 
you can't like COVID can't be top of mind for you. And reading everything that comes out of the CDC or WHO is not going to be the first thing on your list every morning. This has been a great discussion. I want to transition briefly now to the Q&A. So we'll be entertaining questions from the audience as they come in. And we have a first question, which I'll offer uh, to any of the panelists. Should media companies or other platforms seek to create volunteer communities who will play the same role of consensus and moderation? Layla, I wonder if you would like to start with them. Yeah, um, I, I don't have hard evidence for what I'm saying, but I'm gonna share with you my understanding of how Wikipedia works. Um, to me, Wikipedia, the volunteer communities in Wikipedia are doing the amazing work that they're doing partly because they have autonomy and they feel that they own the projects. Um, that sense of ownership and autonomy brings the best out of these many volunteers that contribute. Um, I don't know what mechanisms can work in, let's say, uh, large tech companies or media companies where incentives, incentive, the existing incentive mechanisms are different, right? Especially as you think about the for-profit organizations. Um, I think it's an area that we should think about. Um, so I don't want to say it's not possible, but I want to say that the way that it's working on Wikipedia has a lot of altruistic roots in it that and autonomy and ownership and uh, other components that it's been really hard to implement um, in other setups that we're seeing on the internet. If you, Emma, any, I wonder if you have any reactions about the role of media or other platforms to yeah, help my, the census my, process. My quick thoughts are similar to what Layla is saying in that um, the, that model works and exists on Wikipedia because uh, it is altruistic and folks, there, there aren't, there may be for some folks, but for the most part, there aren't ulterior motives that are driving people to add information there. They're doing it because it's something they care about. Um, on digital platforms, what I've seen through the work that I've done and what has now been widely reported on is all of uh, what we're seeing in the way of misinformation is not just grassroots. There are people who stumble across something and think it's uh, fascinating and then go on to share it. But there is an, a whole economy around and financial incentives around creating health mis and disinformation. And so if the people who want to disseminate good information are not similarly equipped with the resources to create it, there's always going to be an imbalance. You don't have folks like Merkola and RFK Jr. Uh, creating content with no resources. They have entire marketing budgets for what they're pushing out. And so uh, I think that there's an opportunity at least for platforms, if this is something that they say they care about, to then provide resources behind grassroots, or I guess it wouldn't be grassroots, but pr provide resources behind individuals who use the platforms to create good content and to get that shared as well. Because it has to also come from individuals and not just organizations like the WHO, CDC, and NAS, um, because those are established and folks who want information from them are getting it already. We have the next question, which ties into the themes brought up here, which is what has been a good example of this year, in this year of working with NGOs and communities of interest that are working with marginalized groups? Kara, I wonder if you have a thought or Sarah. I mean, I can I can start. I have a, a very um, it's a, a micro story, but it's a, it, it's a quite a heartwarming one, really. Um, WHO had this innovation uh, contest a little while back, um, and it was focused on young people and uh, sharing information around COVID. 
and um, there was one particular group uh, from a hospital in Cape Town, South Africa, that submitted their initiative, which was um, these young people in this hospital, so it was a children's hospital, had um, become aware that a lot of the kids in the hospital had a lot of questions, not just around their own health concerns, but around COVID and around education and around family life. And so they started this uh, radio show in the hospital where they empowered the young people to become reporters and to interview the patients and then to go outside and interview other people and talk about the concerns, talk about um, they would invite experts on to talk about uh, in a way that kids could understand the science, COVID, etc. And then they wanted to expand it to um, other hospitals and the Red Cross was involved and they were able to um, amplify this kind of model. And I think it's to me, it, it speaks to a really um, wonderful way of um, empowering a community devised solution by young people themselves into something that could be rec replicated. Um, and so then it wasn't a, a sort of top-down thing that that um, that uh, somebody came in and said, oh, I see a need, I'm gonna find a solution. It was really this grassroots initiative that was then amplified. And I think that's, an, to me, that was a really, one of the most lovely stories I came across, even though it's kind of a micro one, but. <laughs> Any other of the panelists want to share? There have been good examples. I, 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 live, in, uh, I live in New Mexico and uh, Navajo Nation, which sits across uh, New Mexico and Arizona, had some of the highest per capita numbers for um, COVID cases a few months ago and now is doing much better. Um, and a lot of the issues that they had were because of lack of funding from the federal government, broken promises um, from our US federal government, but communities, local community organizations here in New Mexico and many of them led um, by uh, Navajo residents did drives for um, putting together uh, mass kits and sanitization kits because running water is an issue for a lot of residents. Um, they did a lot of good work um, behind uh, putting filters in people's homes because that was something that was missing and you can't distance when there's nowhere else for people to go. And so there are a lot of local efforts that I think folks can tap into and many of them are um, shared on Facebook and Twitter and other places if folks are looking to get involved. Wonderful examples. Our next question is, mother women make health decisions in many cultures. How might this pandemic be a gender transformative opportunity in communicating health facts to others? Judy, did you say mothers? I missed the first bit. Mothers, mothers okay. Women. Kara, any thoughts? Well, it's not exactly related to that. I feel like as a mother myself, I am um, I resonate with the with the popular discussion going on right now that women are taking a little bit of the brunt of the um, of the pandemic and how that leaves um, women um, in charge of families with very little time to think about. Um, health decisions, let alone all the other decisions. So uh, I don't know if I can see if this as transformative, except that maybe it puts a little spotlight under the um, many different balls that um, female heads of households are balancing all the time. And then um, particularly at this time when we have this added stress um, that the families need to cope with. I think on building on that, I'm, I'm curious, maybe Layla, if you could share your thoughts on ways that um, Wikimedia, for example, um, can, or from your organization, lends a voice around the disproportionate burden of COVID-19 on women as um, care providers, as well as balancing multiple roles. 
Sorry, Julie, your, was your question about the organization itself or? Yes, the, the framework, the framework, the way the content is produced on Wikimedia, um, how that might lend any kind of tool in terms of gender equality. I just wonder your thoughts. I, maybe it's not provable, but you can think about it. Yeah, um, I actually don't have a good answer to this, partly because we don't collect gender specific data on editors and on even on readers, which makes it hard for me to make any kind of um, generalizable statements on, on this topic. Sorry about that. Sarah has a, a point. I just wanted to pick up on the, the um the question, the word transformative, and I think, I mean, I would, I would really like to um, hope that um, if there is one positive thing that comes out of the pandemic, there, there is this shift and 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 in, in towards an acknowledgement of the role of women. I think, just like um, Kara said, there's been a lot of discussion about the disproportionate um, impact on on women, um, but not only that, I think there's been a lot of data coming out saying that you know women are make up the majority of the the health workforce as well and and the health workforce have been very much under spotlight during the COVID-19 pandemic and then the other aspect that I think is um, super interesting is the discussion around leadership and I've seen a lot around how effective leadership during the pandemic um, has been um characterized by a lot of um and i don't want to i don't want to be sexist in my response but by a lot of feminine qualities such as empathy and intuition and um communicating transparently and openly and 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 so i think there are you know there are a lot of positive things that could come out of um this with regards to 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 women that at least i'm quite excited about Absolutely, and I think Leila's point also highlights the ways that we need to enumerate data and to be able to examine it and, and uh, prove these these hypotheses. Uh, I see that we have two minutes left, and so our, in our final question we have, what has been the successes of good content in the past year across the organizations present on the panel? Uh, well, maybe I just briefly say that I'm very proud of the um, quick response that the National Academies has had to the different scientific questions that um, COVID has presented to us. And I think we all know on this panel that communicating science information is difficult because as the pandemic highlights, what we know is constantly evolving. Um, but we've been able to quickly um, assemble the experts uh, to respond to um, new questions as they, as they arise. Um, uh, most recently with an excellent discussion on airborne transmission and what we know about it and what we still need to learn. Uh, so um, I'm heartened by that and I'm heartened by the virtual environment that actually like facilitates some of those quicker conversations as well. Um, I think when we all went to our home offices, we weren't sure how successful that would be, but it's actually proved to be a good model for engaging quickly on new science questions. Can I jump in, Julie? I think um, for me, the kind of the best story of the year so far has been really the work that uh, partly Wikimedia volunteers have done in creating content around COVID-19 across the many languages that they have done over such a short span of time when all of us were hit by a pandemic, right? Um, at a, in a situation that we are all short in time standing on lines to go to grocery store and whatnot. There are people who are dedicated to make this content available in many languages for, for people to access the medical content. Um, what is also as a researcher is amazing for me to see is how the research community came together and decided to go down the path of open science and open data and open up everything. And this obviously as a Wikipedian, I can see the impact of it on Wikipedia as well, right? Wikipedia lives in an ec ecosystem of open science and open data. And it, this is going to have significant impact on the quality of content on Wikipedia as well. Uh, you already see publications um, citing how Wikipedia editors have kept up 
with the latest scientific publications that are coming up in the COVID-19 era. And that has been really heartwarming for me to watch. So we're at the top of the hour. I would like to thank my colleagues. This has really been an honor to hear from you. We've had numerous other questions that we wish we could answer during the live stream, but we will be able to remain on, on this channel afterwards to answer individuals' questions. And we've had clearly thought-provoking um, questions really about how we change the paradigm about how knowledge is created, curated and disseminated, really thinking about communities as our experts and the imperative that we have, the COVID pandemic shows us that we need to do a better job in listening in order to solve this public health crisis. So I'd like to thank my colleagues, thank the audience for their attention and we look forward to ongoing discussion.